Hello and welcome to my channel English Literature Made Easy with Saswati. In this video today I will talk about Samuel Taylor Coleridge's classic poem Kubla Khan. First I will talk about some of the literary trivias which are very important if you are preparing for UGC NET, UGC SET, PGT or PGT examinations or any examinations where you have MCQ based questions. Then I will talk about the poem, I will try and analyze the poem. And last but not the least, I will discuss previous years UGC net questions on the poem. So do stay tuned and watch the video till the end. And if you haven't yet subscribed to my channel, then do subscribe to it. And don't forget to hit the bell icon so that whenever I post a new video, you are the first person to get notified. So first, let's look at some of the literary reviews. The complete title of the poem, Kubla Kha, is Kubla Kha or a vision in a dream. A fragment. As the title of the poem suggests, it is an incomplete poem or it is a fragment. And Coleridge kept this poem for private readings for his friends. This poem was composed by uh, the Romantic poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge in the year 1797, but Coleridge published it in, a, in the year 1816 only because of the persuasion of Lord Byron. It was published only as an attachment to the more substantial poem, Christabel, which was excluded from the second edition of the Lyrical Ballads by William Wordsworth. As Coleridge mentioned in the preface to the poem Kubla Kha, Coleridge wrote this poem from the memory of an opium-influenced dream. Coleridge took laudanum, uh, which is a kind of opium, to treat various health issues that he was suffering from. Coleridge was reading Samuel Parchaz's Parchaz His Pilgrims, which is a 17th century travel book wherein the adventures of early explorers are recounted. Here in this book, Coleridge came across the Yuan dynasty uh, and the summer capital of the Yuan dynasty, Changdu, which was established by the Mongol emperor Kubla Khan or Kublai Khan. After waking up, Coleridge started pinning down his thoughts from the dream. But he was interrupted by a person from Porlock who came to visit uh, Coleridge on business. And once he started writing the poem, after the person went, he could not write anything. And that he had forgotten all the lines from the dream. The next literary trivia is, now the term person from Porlock is used to suggest interrupted genius because Coleridge was interrupted in the middle of his creative genius by that person from Porlock. Nevertheless, whatever fragment we have today is enough to establish Coleridge as a remarkable romantic poet. The original plan uh, for this poem was to write a 200 or 600, 200 to 300 lines uh, but then Coleridge could manage to write only 54 lines as he could remember only this fragment after the dream. It was dismissed by contemporary critics. William Hazlitt who was a romantic poet and critic, uh, he once said that Coleridge could write better nonsense verse than any man in English and because of the fragmentary or incomplete nature of the poem has it said that this poem comes to no conclusion. However, he could notice only one positive quality about the poem and it was the aesthetic quality of the poem. However, now Kubla Kha is considered as one of the three great poems written by Samuel Taylor Coleridge along with The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner and Christopher. So that was the literary trivia about the poem. Now let's look at the analysis of the poem. The poem is divided into three irregular stanzas and they move between different times and place. The opening lines of the poem introduces the ruler of the Mongol Empire in China, Kubla Khan, who ruled during the 13th century AD. He was the grandson of Genghis Khan. Ever since the Venetian explorer Marco Polo wrote about his travels to Zanadu, uh, this Kingdom of Kubla Kha became a symbol of wealth and mystery to the Europeans. And Coleridge further adds to this sense of the mysterious and the exotic through this poem. In stanza 1, we get a glimpse of the power of Kubla Khan. 
as he orders for the construction of a man-made architectural marvel, a stately pleasure dome, his capital, Zanaro. Kukla Khan chooses to build this dome on the site of a sacred river called Alf. This river does not exist in reality, rather it is a creation of Holrige's mind. The name Alf comes from the first letter in the Greek alphabet, Alf. Hence, it can be interpreted as that it stands for the idea of beginning or origin. Now look at the use of the contrast here. The artificial construction versus the natural world. On one hand, there is this man-made pleasure dome and on the other, the sacred river, which is a natural force. There are 10 miles of rich, fertile land enclosed or restricted behind a wall with towers to protect this Mongol emperor's kingdom, Zanaru. Now this pleasure dome is a private domain, which means that it is not available for public viewing. Along with the sacred river, there are ancient forests with flowers and gardens that have been there from time immemorial. These evocative images give the idea of a kind of Eden, an earthly paradise with the interplay of nature and man's creativity. Now let's look at the second stanza. In the second stanza, Coleridge again takes us back to the river Alf and its origin. The river Alf erupts like a volcano from a deep chasm or crack in the hill covered in cedar trees. Coleridge calls it a deep romantic chasm as it is mysterious. Here he talks about the violent and wild origin of the river and the uncontrollable force of nature. He is giving us the contrasting image of beauty and chaos. Coleridge calls this river measureless to man because it flows into vast caves or caverns beyond man's reach to a sunless sea, a place without light and life. Alongside this violent, wild origin of the river, we have this haunting or gothic image of a woman who is wailing or crying for her demon lover that makes this place even more mysterious and supernatural. Here we can see the coexistence of the natural and the supernatural. And this coexistence of the natural and the supernatural is very much common in Coleridge's poetry. Remember Coleridge used Gothic and supernatural elements in his poems such as The Rime of the Ancient Mariner and Christopher. And now in this poem Kubla Khan. He even wrote reviews for Anne Radcliffe's book. If you don't know who is Anne Radcliffe, let me tell you Anne Radcliffe was uh, one of the pioneers of Gothic fiction in the 19th century. Coming back to the poem again, there is this image of a shadow of the pleasure dome floating in the water. And Kubla Khan hears ancient voices forecasting war. The wild, tumultuous origin of the river seems to give a warning that human creations are not permanent. The voices of the ancestors give testimony to the fact that all creations, all great creations of the world, here creations means the artificial creations or man-made creations, eventually has to come to an end. Hence, the stately pleasure dome is also threatened with the destruction of war. Now pay attention to the intriguing contrast in the second stanza. A sunny pleasure dome with caves of ice. Sunny and caves made of ice. Think about it. Can they dwell together? Won't ice get melted in the presence of the sun? So what is Coleridge trying to suggest through these contrasting images? Perhaps he is trying to suggest that man-made constructions or artificial constructions are transitory while nature endures forever. Now come to the third stanza. In the third stanza, the narrator refers to a vision of an unidentified Abyssinian maid who sings of Mount Abora. Abyssinia is another name for Ethiopia, while Mount Abora is the name of Coleridge's fantasy, which some believe comes from the name Mount Amara. Mount Amara is a mountain that is described by John Milton in Paradise Lost, which lies in the at the source of the river Nile. 
in Ethiopia or Abyssinia. So here Coleridge places this African paradise of nature against Kubla Khas artificial paradise at Zanado. This woman in the dream is playing a musical instrument called dulcimer, which is a musical instrument with strings. The speaker says that if he could revive her song within himself, that means if he could bring it back to life from the dream vision, then he would revive the pressure dome with music and words. Here, pause for a moment and understand that Kubla Khan's monument of luxury and pleasure, Zanado, is not a physical construction, but rather it is an unbuilt monument of imagination. Here, perhaps Coleridge is referring to the loss of poetic inspiration. He wrote this last stanza after the interruption. Remember, Coleridge could not revive the memory of that opium influenced dream after that interruption by the man from Porlock. So perhaps he is hinting at the loss of poetic inspiration and the limitations of poetic creation. Now let's try to find out the connecting points in the three stanzas. In the first stanza, we got the idea of human or artificial creation through the medium of the pleasure room in Zanado. In the second stanza, we got the idea of creation again. But this time, we got the idea of creation of nature through the river Alf. And we got the idea of the permanent force of nature as against the transient nature of human or artificial creativity. In the third stanza, again Coleridge tries to bring forth the idea of creation. But here, we get the idea of poetic creation and its limitations. So as you can see, the theme of creation when I say creation, I mean different nature of creation run through the poem. Along with that, the idea of imagination and the supernatural find a considerable place in the poem. Please pay attention to the use of various evocative and contrasting images in the poem. Now, let's look at some of the previous year's questions from UGC Net on the poem Koblaka. So, in June, uh, 2007, there was this question wherein they asked, Coleridge's Kubla Khan remains a fragment because, and they have given four options because it is an MCQ based question. So the first option is, he was called by Watsot to, uh, who was living in Porlock at that time. Option B was, Dorothy Watsot was upset over their love affair. Option C, he was interrupted by a caller, a person on business from Porlock. Option D, he ran out of his stock of opium. So while discussing about the literary trivias, I already mentioned that Coleridge was interrupted by a caller, a person on business from Porlock. So option C will be the correct option here. In December 2012, there was again this question wherein they asked, Kubla Khan takes an epigraph from option A, Samuel Parchazes, Parchaz his pilgrims, option B, Hakluyt's Voices, Option C, the book named The Governor, Option D, Sir Thomas More's Utopia. And again, I have already talked about it while discussing the literary trivias. So, Option A will be the correct answer here, which is Samuel Parchaz's Parchaz's Pilgrims. In July 2016, again there was this question. Kubla Kha is thought to have been written in 1797, but it was not published until 1816. Who persuaded Coleridge to publish it? The four options are option A, Wordsworth, option B, Byron, option C, Kitts, option D, Wordsworth's sister. And the correct answer is option B, Lord Byron. And I have already mentioned about all of them in discussing the literary trivia. Then there was this question again. A half sentence in Parcha's His Pilgrims triggered off Kubla Khan whose work was Parchasi's pilgrims. So it's a repetition of that question, which we have already discussed. Option A, Robert Herrick, the poetess. Option B, John Hucklewitz, the collector of travelers' tales. Option C, Samuel Parchas, the London persons. Option D, Edward Parchas, the globe trotters. And the correct answer will be C, Samuel Parchas, the London persons. So that was all for this video. I hope to see you soon in the next video. So till then, 
take care of yourselves and 